First lecture, Wednesday, April 20th. We're going to be finishing up talking about the marine ecosystems that we're looking at, specifically polar ecosystems. So we looked at some of this the other day in the previous lecture, and we looked at the characteristics of polar environments in general. Certainly have kind of harsh extreme conditions that organisms have to deal with. And there are some characteristics that are common in polar organisms, especially in terms of dealing with cold. There's also a lot of seasonal fluctuation in the avail availability of food and sunlight, which starts the whole thing in terms of primary production. So now we're going to look at Take in consideration some of the differences between this Arctic marine ecosystem where you've got a shallow ocean that's covered with ice and the Antarctic where you've got a continent with continental shelves that extend out and drop off pretty quickly into relatively deep water and ice that ebbs and flows from the perimeter of the continent. Quite different ecosystems in some ways, even though they're both polar ecosystems. And as a result of that, if you look at mammals and seabirds and fishes in the Arctic versus Antarctic, there's some major differences that are related to these differing environmental conditions in the two polar ecosystems at opposite ends of the world. So let's start with the Arctic. In the Arctic polar ecosystem, there is a, it's relatively shallow. The access to nutrients isn't that far away. On the bottom from the phytoplankton on the top. However, there's a lot of seasonality in terms of primary product productivity. So in the summertime, it's pretty productive. There's a lot of photosynthesis. A lot of zooplankton that feeds on the phytoplankton. There's a lot of food for all the different organisms, all the way up to big mammals and big birds. And if you see what the marine mammals do and the birds, these large vertebrates that are common in Arctic environments, there's a lot of seasonal migration. There's a lot of things that seasonally migrate. If they're capable of moving long distances, which most of these are, then the, not the total rule, but the general rule, with a few exceptions, is that they migrate seasonally. So that's what you'll see, that in the summertime, it's a good environment to be in. It's pretty productive. There's a lot of energy. If you can tolerate the cold, it's not even as cold. But these... Arctic organisms can certainly do that. And then if you stay there, you've either got to fast or be able to tolerate these conditions where there's not so much energy. And of course, small organisms have to do that. So there's big population fluctuations. There's individuals that die off. If you're big enough, though, a more common thing is to migrate south during those harsh winter conditions. So if you were to look at productivity, you can measure productivity in a number of different ways. As we saw earlier in the semester, you can look at carbon, which is what's going on in terms of photosynthesis. Carbon is being fixed, joined together with ATP to make sugars. That's primary productivity. Another way is looking at chlorophyll. So this particular video shows changes, seasonal changes, with uh, primary productivity me measured by carbon. And so when it gets to be red, and this is August, October, November, December, it's very, very little energy. So you can see the months there changing. That's October, November, December. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September. You can see when the red shows up in the early part of the year. Here comes the red in the summertime. It's very productive. There's a lot of carbon that's being fixed. There's a lot of primary productivity. 
Whereas in the dead of the winter, this is the summertime, and then it's fading out into the winter. This is December, January. There's hardly anything going on there. So those are the seasonal fluctuations that you find in terms of primary productivity. There's a really good time of the year, and there's a other time of the year what's not so good. And in case you're trying to figure out this map, this is the, looking down on the North Pole, basically. You can see Greenland or Alaska, Russia. That's where the Arctic is. And this, this uh, ice flow ebbs and flows as well. It, uh, it contracts and expands seasonally, covers a lot of the water, and makes it unavailable for sunlight and primary productivity. Well, let's look at some of the inhabitants of the Arctic. Let's look at mammals. This is a fleeting environment. This ice, it comes and goes, it melts, it's big, it's small. There's a lot of ice, there's less ice, and it's melting. With climate change, it's something certainly that Arctic organisms are going to have to deal with. But in terms of pinnipeds, first of all, very common up there. There's a lot of seals, sea lions. There used to be a, a manatee-like marine mammal that has gone extinct from being killed by humans. With these pinnipeds, though, they breed in a short period of time. They mate in the water sometimes. They, uh, they, there's not that much stable environment for them to climb out of the water, give birth, take care of their pups. So it's a shortened period of time. They feed them a lot of food pretty quickly, they grow pretty quickly, and then with a matter of within a matter of weeks, or sometimes even days, these little seals are ready to go. And the, in the water they go. And it's also harder to defend a resource. Some seals are capable of defending blowholes or uh, not blowholes, but holes in the ice where you come in breathing holes. And they're they're able to defend those and round up females that way. But monogamy is is a lot more common because you just don't have the resources that you can defend to establish a harem like you can someplace where there's a solid substrate like a, a beach. This is ice. So they even mate in the water sometimes. Another big inhabitant of the Arctic, of course, is polar bears. Polar bears are all over the place. And they are really dependent upon this pack ice. They hunt on the pack ice. They travel on the pack ice. They can swim long distances. Very good predators on seals, but they, they're really dependent on this pack ice. During the summer, uh, there's not as much ice. There's not as much access to the seals. In the winter, they can seasonally migrate down where there's a, a lot of interaction with humans sometimes. So these polar bears, it's cold, big bears. So what kind of adaptations do polar bears have in terms of dealing with the cold? Well, in terms of behavior, as I said, they make these migrations. They migrate south in the winter during the harshest periods of time. And uh, that's what they do over the long term. Shorter term, they can curl up in, in shelters and keep themselves warm that way. They have insulation. They have a number of forms of insulation. One is blubber that they have, a layer of fat that's a very good insulator of heat. They also have fur. They've got a couple of different types of hair or fur, a combination of hair and fur. Their hair shafts are hollow, and so it reflects light. So when you look at a polar bear, it looks like it's white. And then their skin underneath their hair is black, as some of you probably know. So this ultraviolet light passes through the hair, hits this black skin, which absorbs a lot of heat. There may not be that much sunlight hitting their black skin. But whatever sunlight there is, it heats up their bodies. And then in addition to that, they have the, the lipids that they have. The lipids, these fats, or the blubber, is different in uh, different parts of their body depending on how exposed their parts of the body are and depending on what kind of temperatures they experience. And it interferes with them, um, or it, it's related to these lipids not melting 
when there's a certain temperature. It's related to heat resistance anyway, or actually cold resistance more than heat resistance. So I want to show you a video of polar bears. Polar bear's fur is not white. The fur is actually transparent. It consists of two layers of transparent hair, a soft, thick undercoat, and a layer of hollow guard hairs. The layers only appear white because the air spaces in each hair scatter all visible wavelengths of light. Underneath this fur, polar bears have black skin. Sunlight can penetrate the bear's transparent fur and reach its black skin, which absorbs the sun's heat and warms the bear's body. Polar bears are excellent swimmers. They've evolved to have a narrow skull and a long, flexible neck, which are believed to help streamline their bodies in the water and provide the reach and flexibility they need to bring their noses up for air. Their front paws are large, up to 12 inches wide, flat, and act as paddles as the bears swim and even hunt marine animals while underwater. Additionally, the bears have a two to four inch layer of fat that helps keep them buoyant and warm as they swim. Polar bears are the largest land carnivore. They may grow up to eight feet tall and weigh over 1,760 pounds, far outweighing the next largest land predator, the Kodiak brown bear, by several hundreds of pounds. This hefty size allows polar bears to hunt large, powerful animals like walruses and beluga whales. Because of their tremendous size, polar bears have no natural predators, apart from humans. Polar bears only live in the Arctic. This region includes areas of Russia, Greenland, Norway, and the United States. However, up to 80% of the world's polar bears live in one country, Canada. Polar bears may traverse islands and coastlines, but most of the time, the bears live directly on sea ice that can be found between land masses. However, as climate change is causing sea ice to recede, polar bears are beginning to make their way further inland to find food. Polar bears are not endangered, for now. Between 22,000 and 31,000 polar bears are in the wild, but their populations may be at risk in the future. Climate change and rising ocean temperatures are causing sea ice, the polar bear's hunting grounds, to melt more rapidly and for longer periods of time. This may play a role in a projected 30% population decrease by 2050. Life on top of the world comes with many challenges, but with translucent fur, strong swimming capabilities, and considerable body size, polar bears have become well adapted to life in the wintry north. Well, that's a lot of the same information that I gave you, but it's, I'm sure, more entertaining watching a video of polar bears than looking at these static slides. Few more things about Arctic mammals, besides polar bears and seals, pinnipeds, there's whales. And what characterizes most whales, not all of them, but most whales, is seasonal migration. We saw this when we were looking at cetaceans earlier in the semester. But there's this tendency for migration to and from the poles, close to the equator when it gets cold and towards the poles it went in the summertime when it's warmer. So during the summer we saw there's a lot of primary production, a lot of food there. And so it's a good place to be if you're a, a whale, you're capable of moving long distances. So why not go up there, these high latitudes where there's a lot of productivity, there's a lot of food for you. And when, it, when you're up there, you can give birth and uh, your, your young can come with you and you can gather a lot of food that you store in your body. So when you make the seasonal migration for breeding towards the pole, towards a warmer place to give birth, then you've got a lot of energy and you don't have to feed so much 
because you've loaded up your body on on this available food that's plentiful during the summer up in the Arctic. And so there's a lot of plankton up there. There's some krill. There's a lot of things for filter feeding baleen whales to eat, which is what we're talking about now. There's a few species like the bowhead whale and the minke whale that don't migrate very far, if at all. Beluga whale is another one. And the narwhal, in terms of migration, that we'll look at in the, the toothed whales. But for the baleen whales, if you're big and there's this seasonal availability of a large amount of prey, then you're capable of making these long distance migrations that provide you with a lot of food and help in success of the offspring. Here's an, an example of some humpback whale migrations. Now they might not go up into the really, really high latitudes, but they go up pretty far. So you can see the green, looking at the Arctic anyway, these green feeding areas that are up pretty, pretty far north. And then the breeding areas, you can see there's Hawaii and there's Baja California and there's uh, Central and South America, the Caribbean. So they move towards the, the equator when it's cold and, and that's where they give birth. They breed, give birth. They've got a lot of energy when they're there to take part in those activities. Now these other whales, besides the filter feeding ones, the toothed whales, also pretty common up in the, the Arctic. There's the beluga whale, which uh, we have at Mystic Aquarium. Now, you guys uh, didn't get to go to Mystic Aquarium, did you? But if you would have gone to Mystic Aquarium, maybe you did. So long ago, I don't remember, but they have beluga whales. It's one of their claim to fame. So if you didn't get to go there with our class, you can go there on your own sometime. I know some of you volunteer there. Some of you actually work with, with the beluga whales or other marine mammals there. Narwhals or another, this odd looking whale, tooth whale with the big tusk, that uh, the unicorn, unicorn whale. And then there's killer whales. Killer whales are up there. So these don't necessarily migrate very much. They have to have some mechanism for staying up there. The beluga whale, if you look at its head, it's got this big bulb on its head, this dorsal ridge, supposedly related to breaking holes in the ice so that they can breathe. And then let's look at seabirds. There are a lot of seabirds that migrate seasonally up to the Arctic. It's a really productive area during the summer. There's a lot of food. If you can get around easily, like a bird that can fly thousands of miles in a short period of time, it's no difficult task, then why not migrate up there? It's a very good place to feed, get food, and uh, even nest, have nesting colonies. In the winter, there's hardly anything to eat, but you're a bird capable of very long distance migration. So you can Get up, fly away, fly south for the winter. So the common ones, there's the auk commonly up there. There's the puffin, this very charismatic bird has some, some of the, it's not quite like penguin, but it's got some characteristics. Penguin, there's also petrels, there's fulmores, there's terns that migrate all the way up there. And uh, there, there's even some albatrosses, although albatrosses tend to be more in the southern hemisphere. And then, like I said, the seasonal reproduction. You can migrate thousands of miles pretty easily, fly up to these places in the summertime, a lot of food, nesting, good place to raise your young, and then you head south for the winter. So what do they do up there? They're, they're gliders. They can talk, They have a, a lower body temperature, especially their extremities, like their feet. And even their eggs can develop in the colder temperatures. Okay, so that is a very quick summary of the conditions that you find in the Arctic and some of the animals that you find there and some of their behaviors or some characteristics about their biology that are closely associated with those environmental characteristics and the, especially the periodicity of 
production. So now we'll turn our attention to the Antarctic in this second lecture.